want to do any of the remembering today? No white appears that I'm going to brainwash me. This gallery is in itself a work of art. I'm surprised at how many people have a car. They won't let their wives drive it. I sort of realize that there aren't any people of color in those apartments. Women in Australia retire with 35% less super than men. And we're sick of it. The system was never built for us. So, Verve Super was. Verve was founded by women to support women to build wealth and invest in a better world. While we all work together for change. Because super is power. And women deserve more of both. Verve. Proud partner of All About Women 2021. Where are me? Wala mabemai. Juba gali. Nora gadigu mudjin. Gurga weary gagala gui. Yaguna bariala anga bujuri gunyalo yalo. The Sydney Opera House acknowledges the lands of the Gadigal, and we welcome you to Juba gali, now known as Benelong Point. The Sydney Opera House honours our First Nations by fostering a shared sense of belonging for all Australians. And we pay our deep respects to the Gadigal people, traditional custodians of Jubagali. Welcome to the Sydney Opera House and enjoy the show. Welcome to Life, a Survival Guide, a socially distanced vibe, <laughs> as is the way. Um, my name's Linda Mariano, and this hour's going to go very quickly. We've already talked about how we're going to get the playoff music, so we're going to have to <laughs> really get into it. We've got Mary Huang, the amazing head psychologist and founder of the Indigo Project, and of course, the author of Darkness is Golden, and Christine Jackman, <laughs> journalist and author of a brilliant new book, not her first book, won't be her last, <laughs> Turning Down the Noise. So we've, um, we, have a lot, we have a lot to cover. Oh, and also, before I forget, we are using a program called Slido to very modern, but take in your um, questions for any Q&As that we might want to get into as well. So if you're here or if you're joining us at home, um, open up any browser, go to sli.do and type in the event code All About Women, select the venue that we're in right now, which is the Drama Theatre, and then you can submit questions. And if you see a question there that you think is awesome and you want to upvote it, then I think you can do like a thumbs up and I'll be checking that as well. So, where, where, where? Can I? Uh... Oh, here we go. Yes, it's working. Trying to connect. Classic Australian internet. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, look, where should we begin in this tiny topic of surviving life, particularly as women? I guess we should talk at the start here about the particular challenges that we've been facing in this last year and why they are unique to women. Mary, maybe you want to start? Well, you know, the last year has been an absolute shit storm for everyone. <laughs> and particularly for women, you know, as a psychologist, I really acknowledge that we all want to be in control of our lives, but the last year has really shown us how not in control we are in our lives. And I think that's been really difficult for everyone. I think it's really lifted the veil of this sense of control that we thought we had, and it's making us feel anxious. It's probably exacerbating what has already been there underneath mm -hmm. the surface that we tend to cover up with being busy and having plans and having lots of things to do and trying to be amazing as we all are. And it's been tough. So we women, we're actually 
grieving. You know, we're going through a big collective journey of grief and loss of all the things that we can't do anymore. And is it true as well? I think I was reading the statistics about job loss and about the specific groups of people that it affects and because the majority of the casual workforce are women, they are the ones that have, we are the ones that have suffered the most in terms of our identity that falls under that as well, right? That's right. And the women are taking the majority of that unpaid work. So they're with working with the children and being with children, being with the elderly. We're taking that higher strain when it when it comes to particularly in the last year but kind of always yeah to be honest and let's talk about something that you mentioned just then which is covering it up being busy suppressing the emotions i do it fucking well oh i don't know if i can say that <laughs> i do it well i do it to a set she I said it she wouldn't use that degree. word. You said you wouldn't use that word. I told you. I told you. <laughs> we had a chat it's because about you this. planted it. Mary <laughs> said, "What can we say? What can't we say?" Uh, I just but, had to get it out. But we're all. Shit. <laughs> and now that I've said it, it won't happen again. But we're good at this. I'm sure that you are good at it as well, to a degree. Christine, you are fantastic at this. What happens when we suppress and we surround ourselves with noise and the cult of busyness, what's the effect? Yeah, well, yes, I, I was uh, very good at it for a long time. I was the queen of the to-do list, you know. It's, it's, it can all be done as long as I can put it on a to-do list. It can all be done because I've got two phones. There was a, I, I think that's the <laughs> pinnacle of freaking success right there. You or, have two phones. You or know. a drug dealer. <laughs> <laughs> Were you double scrolling? <laughs> Yeah, you're dual scrolling. Um, I was travelling a lot, so I got to a point where in Sydney, I, the guys at the security um, you know, station in Qantas knew me, knew me by name. That, that's how busy I was. What happens? Well, for me, it was uh, some of the symptoms uh, underlying just constant feeling of not being well. So I was going to doctor, you know, my GP. I had the full range of bloods and stuff like that. And I'll never forget the... Um, day in the office where she just said, you know, it's good news, you know, you're fine. And I thought, oh, shit, you know, I just... Sorry. Um, <laughs> but that doesn't explain why I don't feel well, so I wasn't sleeping. Here, you know, the, the, the giveaways, you know, anxiety, constant feeling that stuff wasn't done, something was going to go wrong if I, if I stopped running. Um, Insomnia, classic. But for me particularly, and it's what led to turning down the noise, was for me, the sim I, I was dealing with the world and feeling like the volume was constantly too far up and I couldn't turn it down. So I would get home at night and walk through the door and I had my two sons were in upper primary by that stage. And it sounds awful to say this, but just them greeting me when I got home was... The noise was so sharp, I would actually physically cringe. Um, yeah, I know, well, it's, it's, it's an awful thing. No, and my, the same with my partner. You get to a point where it was just like, I can't talk, don't talk. You know, too much talking. Mm. Uh, and I think that's, you know, we look for physical explanations of that in our world. In our world, we're reasonably good or we think we're reasonably good with Western medicine at finding physical explanations, or at least here's a pill because you're feeling anxiety. But my GP did say to me once something that day. She said, you know, I said, I don't feel great. And she actually said to me, I have a lot of patients like you. She said, you know, you're, you're different. But she said, she, she said you're different because you, you're in comms but, um, and journalism. But she said, yeah, most of them are lawyers. They're just, they're doing so much. And that was the first thing where I started thinking, you know, maybe it's not... Maybe I'm having a healthy reaction to a really unhealthy life. That, yeah, that unhealthy work <laughs> expectation, but the expectations also that we put on ourselves. Why do we do that? Why do we put so much expectations yeah. on ourselves? It comes from so many different places. So from the individual, we have high expectations because we're trying to fit in, we want to belong, we want to be connected with people, so then we think, gosh, I've just got to be like everyone else. 
media, advertising, mm -hmm. telling us that we need to look a certain way, that we need to be a certain way. This is what success means. Our parents, my <laughs> parents, that's what I'm really talking about. Yeah. Very conservative, wanted me to do really well at school. All the things, a lot of pressure. So, you know, I don't think I'm the only one that's had pressure from their parents and their culture to be a certain, certain way. So it comes from so many different aspects on so many different levels. And that's why we've got to be careful when we say, I'm not feeling well and I've got to do something about this and I've got to make a change. There's one level where that makes absolute sense. We, we are empowered as mm. human beings to take control of our lives and be more present with our own lives. But at the same time, there are some huge questions that we need to ask about power and privilege and why these decisions that people are making about what we think is best and how we should be better. But actually, it's not really always about being better and a better version of ourselves. We're pretty awesome just as we are. <laughs> I know. What's, what are those questions that we need to sit and ask ourselves? I know that you talk a lot about what our actual needs are, how we meet them, how we acknowledge the hardships. Our needs are crucial. You know, they are our emotional, psychological needs. It's just like having water and food, we need connection. You know, we need safe spaces where we can share our feelings and, and be heard and, and really feel safe with our relationships. We need to understand our values, what is really truly important to us, not what's been told to us by our parents and society and all the things that we're consuming every day. We need to know what our priority is, priorities are, but when we have these to-do lists with a million things to do, it feels like everything is a priority, but it's not. And I think the last year has shown us that we can do a lot less yeah. and focus on what's really important. And I'd be really sad if it kind of quickly goes back to what it was before. And these, this is why we need to have these conversations because yeah. I'm not ready to go back to that. That was really unhealthy. My life was really unhealthy. And I think we just need a kind of keep the slow pause thing happening. Yeah, we're going to have to talk about boundaries at some <clears> point and, and how we figure out what those boundaries are because I know that it, it's a really slippery slope of saying yes, people-pleasing, external achievement. Look at these things I can do. Look at all these balls I can have up in the air. It's so great. Um, Christine knows. <laughs> Christine knows. I wanted to pinpoint something that you talk about in your book, which I think feels particularly relevant increasingly throughout the last few years, but particularly in the last year as well, and it was about the impact of digital devices and especially with what's happened in the last year where we are often more isolated or working from home and the 24-hour news cycle. And, you know, I think we all know that it's not always helpful it can be really harmful, but you, in your book, dive into the science behind it and the kind of hard facts in terms of what it does to our brains. Can you explain that? Yeah. Um, yeah, because, I mean, firstly, is a, my book is a memoir, but it's also because I'm a journalist. I sort of thought, I don't want to just do a sort of a, you know, forgive me, but a sort of an eat, pray, love personal experience. As much as that was really valid for Elizabeth Gilbert, I, I, the journalist in me thought, I need to really look at what's going on. Why do I feel... Why is noise making me feel unwell? Um, and I realised very quickly... I went through this lovely stage of walking around with my phone. I had an audio meter <laughs> because I thought it was a decibel thing. So I was like, <laughs> everywhere I'd go, I'd be measuring... <laughs> Um, and then, yeah, that was a bit weird. Um, and then I realised you can be... I use in the book the example, think about it, you can be sitting... You can find the quietest place you want. I went to one of the quietest places in continental US, the USA, um, a place called One Square Inch of Silence. I went to silent retreats. I went to... You know, so you can be in a, in a red, ancient redwood forest where there are, um, there's almost no noise, or in a, a chapel or a temple or, you know, in a silent retreat. But if you have your phone 
and you're scrolling. The noise is in your head. And interestingly, we look back and the, the, the very ancient monks worked this out very quickly. If you go back and read what the ancient the desert fathers and mothers wrote when they fled Rome and went to the desert to, to be in silence and meditate and contemplate the world, they very quickly began writing about, you know, the, the, the devils and the demons in your, in your own head. So this is not new, but what we have now in the last 10 to 15 years is this amaz the amazing tools of neuroscience that can now track what's actually going on inside us when we're exposed to noise. And digital noise particularly um, picks up those sort of, you know, particularly the dopamine loops. And you probably, I think we're all becoming a little bit more digitally literate about this stuff. Recently, we've seen, um, you know, the documentaries about this with people like Tristan Harris um, on, on Netflix talking about how the social, social media particularly uh, is designed to keep us activated and what it's doing when it delivers noise to you in your news feed, in your social media feed, in your alerts, you know, it is pro these things are programmed by some of the smartest, largely young men, young white men um, in, in, in the planet who've been handpicked by big tech to design things that will ping your brain. You get the, um, you know, the little cortisol flare up when, you, when things haven't, you know, I need to check, I haven't received anything, has my email been received? You get the little um, dopamine hit when something you've posted or something you like has, um, has been shared or, or liked as well. So we know this, our brain is in this constant state of activity. What does this mean in terms of um, greater well-being? Well, I think it means that we're more and more always, always on. Um, less comfortable with sitting with ourselves. I was going to add to Mary earlier that I think one of the things we need to do, we've lost the ability to, to play, is the way I like to say it, which means, you know, if you go outside and you lie in the sun or you're on the beach, just lying in the sun and being on the beach rather than I need to let people know about this or I need to share it. I, and that's actually a physical <coughs> thing that's going on there as much as anything. Our brains are now in that state of being constantly active. And the flip side um, applies as well. If, if you've got kids, mine are teenagers, and you take a device away from them, it's like they're going into some form of cold turkey. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. And that again is their brain going, I cannot, it's physically painful for me to be unstimulated. It's so unfamiliar to them. So, uh, that's what's going on. What was the question again? I've gone off. I got, I got lost in the dopamine loop of you, <laughs> yeah, Christine. Yeah, yeah. I love dopamine. And just that idea of having At this like, last the year. same thing like, like gambling, like having a slot machine in your pocket. And I think it's really important for us and I think it's really important for women in this moment because I did it, I've done it twice. Firstly, it's really important to acknowledge that even though I did the whole silence um, journey and you did a 10 to, you did a 10 day silent retreat didn't 10 you? day silent retreat i went to, into nature and tried to find really quiet places and i felt wonderful for it but life goes on life is messy and it's really we, we are it's very easy to fall off the wagon because as mary was saying we're up against a lot you know our work commitments social media that's and and media generally that's designed to catch our attention um, for me, at the beginning of COVID, that was the first time I found myself doing the, you know, anxiety scrolling, thinking I can just look and there'll be something that's going to tell me what the hell's going on. And more, interest, more importantly, or more pertinently for women at the moment, I've noticed it with myself. The last two to three weeks, with the news that's coming out of Canberra, the stories that are coming out of Canberra, I did it this morning. I found myself watching Insiders and watching that conversation between some of our, you know, Kath Catherine Murphy and Annabelle Crabb and, you know, talking about what's the latest and where will this go next. And we all, I think, as women, we feel the need to be heard on this. And we are also feeling incredibly vulnerable, incredibly raw. And I think we all need to nurture ourselves and be very, very aware of what we do with that attention. And as much as we need to support each other and make sure this, this moment is heard, 
um, also recognising that um, being on social media and just getting angrier or sadder or more outraged may not necessarily be and probably isn't the best way to change things at this point. Um, and I, I very strongly feel that at the moment, the number of women, particularly in journalism, um, that I know, because I know personally most of the women who've been involved in breaking this story, um, or these stories, it takes its toll. Secondary trauma is, is a very real thing. Um, and so we have to continually be there to support each other, but also be very, resist that temptation to be hyper aware which I think is what happens when you think, I just need to make sure that this conversation continues. I need to contribute to it because it's so important. And yes, it is important. But so too is just giving you that, giving yourself the self-care to keep going. When you are someone that's in the media industry like yourself or, you know, it, it almost feels like we all are in a way because we all have a voice or we all have social media and well, this really important thing has happened and I think I need to contribute my vote. I will post the black square. You know, like, when that happens, do you have a, a checklist to either of you where you go, should I add my voice to this or is this a moment where I pause and I don't contribute to the noise? How do you make those choices? Yeah, I think we, you know, when we develop a sense of self-awareness, we, we can do that by asking ourselves, you know, what is my intention behind this action that I'm about to do? Is this something that I want to do because I want to seem like I'm contributing? Is it something that I'm like, oh gosh, I've got to make sure that I have something to say in this because otherwise it feels like I'm not a, an active participant? And do I actually have the energy for this? You know, sometimes I think about this in relationship to like calling my mum and I'm like, do I have the energy for this? I'm the same. Am I, I think okay? it's okay. Yeah. It's, yeah you know, I think we have like, the same mother-daughter. Yeah. What's the, we can deal with this. Yeah. But you know, it's, it's just like sometimes you just check in and you go, well, I'm actually feeling really uncomfortable and I'm tired and I actually don't feel like I'm up for this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when it comes to just us being able to tap into that sense of authenticity and like what we were talking about before, our own needs. Like we are active participants in this world and we're trying to do the best that we can, but we can't really be good at it unless we have some sense of how we're doing, our emotional, physical, spiritual energy levels. What I love about both of your books, and if you haven't read either of them or both of them, please do it cover to cover because they're not only about personal experience, but they talk about real ways that you can take those ideas and those philosophies and apply them into your life in not a big kind of grandiose, you need to go on a 10 day silent retreat way, but they give you these practical tools and there's diagrams in Mary's <laughs> book and there's, there's tips all throughout Christine's one as well. But that kind of ties in, there's people, you know, talking about electronic devices here in the in Slido, like Nikki's saying, electronic devices give flexibility for work and social media has become such a big part of our jobs. So you talking about knowing what the intention there is and how we can find the bits of s silence within there. Nikki's saying, how do you manage blurring between the public and private, what you share, and between your work and your leisure time? How do you manage that? Do you clock off? Do you? Well, I think firstly, Mary touched on it. The, the more you give yourself the ability firstly to, to, to when we say self-care, we don't say it glibly, I think. I mean, to get in touch with what do I need right now? And the best way to do that is to, in my view, is to give yourself time on your own, whether it's I'm walking in nature because there's great science to show that um, that helps our brains defrag, you know, just slow down, all that sort of thing. If you can, meditation, um, you don't have to do 10 days of it, but meditation is another <laughs> way of doing it. Ten, 10 minutes a day, you'll start to, to see some results. Unfortunately, and here's the benefit of digital devices, these days you can get on an app and it can guide you through it or help you. Mary's got things. In, that wonderful QR code of your book, which is such a new and exciting thing. So to get music, if it helps, but letting yourself be, and that gives you then, resets the equi equilibrium that, that you can then say, 
what do I need right now? And I have found that. Do I need to, you know, ha post hashtag me too back in the day or like or share? What is the best use of my hour or 15 minutes or 24 hours or whatever I've got available? What can I do that makes a difference? So great example of that, I think, for me, was at the beginning of COVID, again, doing the angst scroll and realising there is zero I am going to achieve by looking at what various politicians are saying about COVID and premiers con um, you know, interacting or complaining about each other. And what I did, and what many of you probably did as well, or I tapped into um, one of our, you know, the neighbourhood projects and got out and, and walked streets and handed, put it letterboxed back in the day to say, if you are in need of, you know, while you're locked down, you need groceries or you need help with anything. Here are the phone numbers of our particular neighbourhood kindness project, I think it was called. And... I think that does great things. One, it goes to what Mary was saying, the connectivity of actually real human beings. Mm. You're actually connecting with your neighbours, you know. But two, you're actually doing something that you have control over. You can make a contribution. So I think it's about giving yourself that time to think, um, to just reflect on how am I feeling right now about this? what can I do that will feel meaningful? Um, and if I don't know, just when those bad feelings come up of, you know, or those feelings of, I need to be involved in this or I need to have my voice heard, actually going back and letting yourself hear first, what do I really need here? You probably can talk about this process much better than I can, Mary. <laughs> Well, Mary, there's some really good questions coming in, actually, that I, I do want to direct at you. There's one that... Oh, wait, where did it just go? Oh, my God, they're going too fast. <laughs> I, swear, I swear it was from Ella. Hold on. Oh, my gosh. Oh, here we go, yes. It, um, and this kind of ties into us talking about boundaries. Mm. Um, Ella says, it's all very well to try and hold boundaries... Uh, but how do we deal with the guilt of feeling selfish? Totally. This is a really good question. Yeah. Because boundaries, chat about boundaries is the most popular topic. Yes. At it's Indigo. almost like this overused term of oh, a self-care day. Oh, I'm doing my wellness. I think we got to take a step <laughs> back. It's funny, isn't it? You're like, you know... Anyway, when we think about, we talk about that boundaries, I think we need to think about this part of ourselves that is called, in my terms, the giver. And this is the part of ourselves that wants the validation, wants to kind of do everything for everyone, feels good when they do things for others. So they're getting that validation, like that, that scroll that we get when someone likes something that we do. And we need to recognise that this is a part of us, especially women. We have this need to nurture and to be wanted and to be needed. And when it comes to boundaries, we have to ask ourselves the question, you know, again, what is my intention around giving? Why do I give so much? Is it because I want to be liked? Is it because I want to be respected? Because I want to be, you know, admired in some way? Or what, is there something else there? And I think that takes us back to, you know, who, how do I validate myself as a person? Do I validate myself through the things that in, extrinsically that I do? Or can I learn to validate myself internally and intrinsically? So boundaries come from a place where we have a sense of our own worth and we know what our needs are. And I often ask my clients, if it's hard for you to set boundaries, why is that? And guilt comes up a lot. I don't want to hurt the person. I don't want to feel bad. And I feel guilty. And it's so good that we actually learn how to feel guilt. Mm. So it's not about trying to get rid of the guilt. It's actually, you know, learning how to be in, a dis in the discomfort instead of reacting to it and say, well, I'll just do it. I'll take you to the airport. I'll do that thing and stay up all night even though I don't really want to do it. What if we said no and we felt the guilt and we found the guilt lived here in our bellies and it felt like a 
big rock and it was not friendly. And if we spoke to it, it just said, you're not being good enough and you're blah, blah, blah. And you're like, okay, I see you, little guilt ball. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's... If we I can, can do this, you can hang out, but I reckon by tomorrow you might be a little bit quieter. And then the next time I set the boundary and I feel the guilt ball come up again, I'm like, hey, I know you. That's what my mum does to me. <laughs> That's my mum's voice. <laughs> yes. It's a bit, I love Janet. that. I know it's... that now. Okay, cool. I'm going to just, you know, we'll have a little chat. We'll have some compassion for that voice because that voice actually, the guilt, not the stuff that comes up that gets in the way, is just trying to protect us. Mm -hmm. It doesn't want us to not be liked. Like I said, we want to belong. We want to feel like we're included and buddies with everyone and achieving. And so, you know, it just doesn't want us to feel that, that like a little lonely child who doesn't have any friends and isn't liked. So we're just going to make friends and be one with the guilt. Yeah. God, that's great. I like the approach. Yeah. Um, this is not my idea. I can't remember where it came from, but I like it anyway. Of making friends with whether it be guilt or, you know, your other little negative voices that you've inherited the courtesy of your parents because the, the shame about being selfish, that's a very big Catholic one as well, but, um, <laughs> is saying, you know, thanks very much, I hear you, you can come on the journey but you're sitting in the back seat today, you're not driving. Also, you're not often, driving the car, you're with me, I get it, but you're right. not, you're not um, navigating or driving the car. But I think it's really important to recognise the... the yeah, we exist in this world that's defined by our parents, first and foremost, and then also the bigger world that de defines our context. And so emotional labour is what you're describing there. So much expected of, of um, women. You're responsible for everybody's happiness. You're responsible for if somebody feels bad, you know, you take that on board. Um, doesn't have an, it's never been quantified, but we're just expected to do it. And then at a larger... Um, in a larger context, what I'm seeing now is there's so many things that yeah, women haven't. Again, we haven't been heard. There is a, there is a, there's a, there's never been um, a GDP figure for domestic labour, for for um, emotional labour. It's just not seen, and yet it's there. So we have women running around trying now to get an education, get qualifications, be in the workforce full time. All of that's acknowledged, and yet all of this other stuff, you know, the, the energy around emotional labour, the energy around domestic work, um, it's never really been acknowledged. So why wouldn't we feel overworked um, and yet think it's our own fault? Because there's not even a language really around that stuff yet. Again, it's what I think we're seeing in Canberra, and I'm sorry I keep coming back to it, except that I think it's such an important thing for women to speak about and share in, in um, environments like this. What we're seeing is a group of largely men just not understanding that this is a big deal, that actually still not getting that it'd be nice to go into your workplace and not have to deal with someone thinking it's OK to touch or comment on your body. You know, why is that a big deal? It's never happened to them. You know, and, and that stuff carries a weight. And we need to keep talking about it because until we have it acknowledged, looked at, a vocabulary around it developed, it won't be, it won't be actively acknowledged as something that, um, that actually impacts in a meaningful way. It's sort of stuff that well, we just don't really talk about it much. Mary, you mentioned earlier about being the giver and that kind of internal dialogue of thinking about the guilt, thinking about pleasing people. There was something else that you cover off in your book and that with the inner voices, the inner critic as well. How do you live with being an inner critic? And you know how sometimes you wear this kind of badge of honour where you go, oh, I'm always going to be the harshest critic. No, no one's going to hurt me because I'm going to be able to critique myself. How do you live with that in a way that sometimes it's, it's nice to be critical because it makes you strive for more, but 
Where's the, where's the boundary within that? Where is it harmful where we're constantly questioning our identity and what we're doing and second-guessing that? The saboteur. Yeah. Well, you know, I talk about the inner critic, the inner saboteur and the inner child. And there are plenty of personalities within us. We all have multiple personalities. Don't want to scare anyone. But we, we <laughs> have so many voices within us that it can feel like there's a family inside our heads, like wanting to get their opinion across. And when it comes to learning how to work with all these, this internal family within us of all these voices, it's about relationships. You know, it's about being able to listen to each of these voices, not react necessarily, but understand where they've come from. Like we've spoken about that voice sounds like my mother's voice, that voice sounds like that girl that was mean at school to me, that voice sounds like this one. And actually there's another voice that's there too, which is the voice of our wise self. And she's pretty amazing. You know, she, she or he has the best intentions for us. And that's the voice that says on a Friday night, everyone's getting a little pissy and you're like, it's time to go home now. <laughs> Take some Panadols and drink some water. You know, that's the voice <clears throat> that we want to learn how to give the centre stage to. So when you think of all the little voices in your head that give you a lot of conflict and you imagine like a boardroom and the wise self is sitting, you know, in, in the big chair and everyone's like getting their say and you go, okay, I'm listening to you. Because what we tend to try to do when we've got that really loud inner critic voice or the inner saboteurs, we try to suppress it. We're like, no, you shut up because that's not good. You know, you just need to go away because I try to do something really important here, so stop telling me off. And it's not helpful when we suppress these voices within us because they are really just trying to help us out. You know, when you get behind their mask, they're just, again, they're kind of protecting the inner child within us that has been hurt, that has been judged, that has been berated, that has to kind of be all these things. So they're not kind of out in the cold anymore. <laughs> so, you know, we've got we've got to try to bring the family together and listen. What what do you do in a practical sense? So I'm hearing what you're saying, I'm like, yep, oh Mary, hitting it right there. I understand. But what do you do? Do you, do you sit in it? Do you spend a day? Do you journal? Do you write it in a diagram? Like how so do we things. take this into the next week of our lives? Yeah, for, it works different ways for different people. If you know that voice in your head, you call it out. Give it a name. Call it Sarah. Call it Karen. Call it whatever you call want. Call it the mean girl at you know, school. Call it the, you know, just actually get to know it. And then you go and you have a conversation with it and you say, what do you need? You know, this is a theme that we've come up a lot. And it might say, I just need you to really do this thing because if you don't do this thing, you're going to look really stupid and, like, I'm going to be really embarrassed. You're like, OK, I got you. And that's the voice. You're like, who is the persona of the wise self coming in here? And what would that wise person say to this inner critic? And then you have that dialogue. And it can literally take a minute. It doesn't have to take a long time. You don't have to go away for 10 days to hear that voice. We all know what those inner voices of the inner critic and the inner saboteur and when that wounded part of us, we know what that sounds like and we just need to ask it what it really needs. And is the red flag of knowing that you need to listen to those voices when you feel a, a red flag of like anxiety flaring up or, or something? Like how, how do you know when it's time to listen? Well, if you... Oh, I am listening if, all If the we time. closed our eyes for even a minute, we would hear lots of different voices. So that's the path of self-awareness is that when we sit quietly and we close our eyes, like no one is hearing nothing when our eyes are closed. We'll have about a million thoughts just within a minute. And then you start to realise there's something that something's always, am I thinking about work? Am I thinking about how I look? Am I thinking, am I doing this right? Is it an anxious voice? You start to realise there are predominant kind of speakers in your mind that are trying to tell you to do something or be better or you're not being enough or not feeling good enough. Mm -hmm. And that's that kind of coming closer to understanding yourself 
and, and being with all of those different voices. It's, it's all relationships. Speaking of understanding yourself, there's a question from Freya that's come in saying, how do women that choose a career-focused life rather than building a family or getting married straight away deal with the label of being selfish or materialistic? It's such a shame that... Tiny question. <laughs> it, 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 it's an absolute shame that, that, that Freya even has to consider that type of criticism. Yeah, that's what kind of jumped out to you know, me, I'm like, that who idea. Who are you hanging out with that's <laughs> that is telling you that? Because they need to go. Yeah, what do you say? What you know, it's like, I would just be like, you need to quit your job and get some better friends if they're telling you that you're materialistic and not doing the right thing because we need to surround ourselves with good people and good influences. Like, I'm a career woman too. Like, I really love what I do and I've worked really hard and I've blood, sweat and tears for my organisation and the people within it. But I've never had anyone ever say that to me before, that I might be selfish or materialistic. In fact, maybe on the other side, I get rewarded for it, which is also really dangerous because... I'm doing the giving thing and people mm. are really enjoying that and people are really getting a lot out of it. And I think sometimes I need someone to say, are you okay? Is this all right for you? And are you, is, is this what you really want to do? Because you don't have to if you don't want to. You can feel good within yourself. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's, it's a difficult it's one. It's complex. Yeah, because I'm like, who is around that person? <laughs> Not very nice. Or Freya, come hang out with us. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> come on down. Come here. Um, what I find very interesting about both of your books is that you both talk about uh, two things that almost sound, if you saw them on paper, at odds. You talk about the, the beauty in tuning into sound and music and the power of that. Christine, you talk about the power of turning down the noise and honing in on the silence. But essentially, it's the same principle. Mm. It's being present. It's actively focusing on something, whether that be the sound that is around you or music that you tune into. Christine, what were some of the practical things that you find that I know that you outlined in your book in terms of finding the silence each day. When you don't need to go to the 10-day retreat, mm. what are the practical things that we can do? Yeah. Um, so in my book, I have slice, uh, slivers. I broke it up into slivers, slices and slabs of silence, meaning that not many people are going to be able to do a 10-day retreat. It's, it took me about 10 years to actually organise my life to get to one. But we can... So we need to have those tools in the back of our mind for when we get those little slivers of time and maybe a few practices that we can try and do daily, which are the, you know, the slices that are actually, you know, in our, in our daily routine. So um, I would say, you know, first off, um, for people particularly if you're not comfortable being on a meditation stool or cushion is, you know, going for a walk somewhere that you feel good in nature, whether it's be by water or, or in... In bushland, I live deliberately now on a, a, a flora and fauna reserve in, in Brisbane because you can walk and be surrounded by trees there um, very quickly. Don't take ear pods. And to get to that state, because I think people, there's a jumping off point that stops a lot of people to get to where Mary was describing because it's really confronting when you first have those racing thoughts and that sense of I should be somewhere else doing something. And that's your brain in survival mode telling you you know, get this done, get this done, because it's used to operating like that. So what I say to people, if you, if you feel confronted by just being alone, walking on a bush trail or by the harbour or on a beach, take yourself into a space where you actually actively name things. It sounds odd, but there's a tree. There's a wave the breeze is hitting me there. That's an active process of grounding. And for some people that's really useful because it just gets you back out of your thoughts into your body, making you feel safe. It's okay, you're here. And then slowly you can start to do that thing of observing where are these thoughts coming from? I don't need to buy into 
you have to do that right now or the world's going to end. Just observe it. What's it saying? Which is where Mary was going. So that's a good one, just giving yourself the breathing space of being out in nature, physically grounded. Some other ones I use are... Um, uh, I, there's one that I think in Buddhist terminology is the half moon meditation, but it's basically just a, a gentle smile. You can do th with three breaths. So a smile because it gives your body the signal that I am happy. Sometimes the cart goes before the horse. Usually something happens, we're happy, and then we smile. But if we smile, you can trick your body. <laughs> Thinks, okay, I'm going to release some of those hormones. I feel good. And this can work even, you know, drop the kids off at school, driving to work or, or I'm at a red light um, you don't want to miss that red light so lock your eyes on that red light face smile I'm not going to do it because I'll look crazy um, <laughs> three belly breaths just <laughs> regrounding um, I do one for and I loved this when I was working in the city um, here Give yourself a little um, task, maybe once a week, of um, what I call the quiet quest. Go and find spaces. Make it fun, because if something's fun, you might do it again. Go and find a space that's quiet, that you didn't know about in your lunch break. Rather than go to the really noisy food court or eat at your desk, go that today I'm going to go and find a quiet place. And I loved that because you discover these little places in your own city or your own suburb that you didn't know, whether it's sitting at a park bench, you know, that overlooks something interesting or, you know, you go to the state library if you're in the city. I mean, libraries and museums, you know, might be there for you to actually actively go and do something, but they're usually full of beautiful little quiet nooks. Sit on the grass in a, in a park, but just find a space that you didn't know existed once a week. Um, and again, what that does is it just brings you back into the present. It's not, oh my God, I have to meditate for half an hour. It's just letting your body enjoy being present and it's taking you out of those thoughts. And then what happens is once you get used to that, you can then start going, okay, what are some of those thoughts that are bumping around? What are they, what are they telling me? What are they making me feel? But often we have to do those other practices first that allow us to just be not lost in the thoughts. Um, the one last one I'd say is I went through a phase during COVID where everybody else was starting to work at home and I took a contract doing some communications work for a hospital that was doing COVID research in ICU. And I was finding, my, finding myself getting into traffic and getting into that car park at the hospital and just feeling like, okay, what's next? And I realised hmm, someone wrote a book about this. <laughs> oh, that would be, that would be me. <laughs> Uh, moment of humility, and I call it the car pod, car pod cone of silence, where you get in the car and you don't return calls. You don't listen to a podcast that, you know, because I need to catch up on things. Just allow yourself, when you get into the car for the 15 minute journey, occasionally do it in silence. Um, and when I would get to the car park before I got out and started my day again, Checking in, how am I feeling? What am I seeing? Okay, now I'm ready to, to go forth. Mm -hmm. Part of that is, there's lots of reasons why that's good, but one of them is that there's research that shows by a woman called Gloria Marks that shows, you know, our brains do act a, a, bit, a little bit like computer screen, computers. That if you open a task and you don't close it down properly, it stays like one of the browser windows, chewing up energy, and your brain's going, but we need to get back to that one. So sometimes it's important during your day to just go, and I'm finished that. That's where I'm coming back to, but I am finished that now. I'm going on to the next thing now. So there's a few. There are more in my book. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> There are. There is, there's, there's so much to soak up in your book, in Mary's book. Oh, gosh, where do we... We've got eight minutes left. I'm looking at the clock. Uh, Mary, there's a lot of questions coming in as well about give us more specific tools and tips to survive in the day-to-day. -day. Yes. 
Um, ritual is really important and I think it's important that we talk a little bit about music and how we can use that in our lives in a really simple and easy way because we all have access to headphones, Spotify, we can reach any single song that we want and music is medicine and we are the best doctors at prescribing ourselves a bit of medicine because we know what we need, you know, when we need to lift ourselves up, when we need to have a little cry, you know, when we ask us, we can ask ourselves, you know, what do I need this morning? And we can create a little bit of a ritual around music and use that as a form of meditation or actually just developing a relationship with ourselves. So my ritual in the morning, I get up, I light a stick of incense, I say thank you for my day, you know, I sit down, I pull an angel card, which is my little woo-woo thing that I do. <laughs> and then, you know, I choose a song. And that could be, you know, I just want something to meet me where I'm at. So I, you know, I've designed a, a playlist that comes with my book. It's, um, it's on Spotify. And it's something that people can really easily access, but it gets you in touch with your emotions. Mm -hmm. So we suppress a lot and we're not really feeling all the feels. And I think we need to feel to heal. And we're carrying a lot of baggage that we need to unpack. And sometimes we just wake up and we're not really feeling with it. So music needs to meet us, you know, it can meet us where we're at. It doesn't really ask anything from us, it doesn't have any expectations. It's just our friend that can accompany, accompany us. And as we really listen, and really give it our full attention, not trying to do other things at the same time. We can just be with it. And at the least, we're appreciating what a beautiful song it is. Mm. But at the very most, we're understanding how we're feeling that day. And we're saying again, hi, how are you? What's going on today? And we're accepting ourselves the way we are. So. You know, these little things around music, and it's, it's not about being better. When we use these tools, it's not necessarily about feeling better. In my opinion, as a psychologist, it's about learning how to feel and letting us be however we are, not better, just as we are. And when we accept ourselves, that's when we can learn to value ourselves more. This is the basis of self-love and self-respect. These aren't really floaty terms. That actually, when we bring it back down, we're just saying, okay, I'm feeling this and I'm thinking this and my body feels like this and that's totally cool. So we should be our own DJs and it's so much easier to do that when sometimes meditating, I used to meditate a lot in silence and it was, it's really hard to just get super distracted. But you know, one song, headphones, simple. We've got that. Transformational. Transformational. Mm. That feeling of being better, it's, mm. it's something that I've thought about so much because, and you might be the same too, I would s delay going for a walk for 15 minutes because as I'd put my shoes on, I would be scrolling through to find the album that I needed to listen to to <laughs> analyse or the, the podcast that would be the best use of my time. I'm like, yes. I'm going for a walk for 30 minutes and the podcast I listen to must be amazing, you know? So I'd sit there and I'd be like, oh, I'll listen to the first minute of that. No, not the right one. Listen to the trailer of this one. No, I think I need fiction. And then you just go down this thing because you go every moment, I'm, I'm so busy that every moment of my life I need to be consuming something that is going to add and I'm not going to just be. I'm not going to just listen to the music to be present and to consume it. I, I need to listen to something that's going to stimulate me. That's which is so dangerous. And I have, learned, have had to learn how to unlearn that. Mm. That's because we're constantly, I think, in the current climate, particularly in the modern economy, it is an economy rather than a community mm -hmm. nowadays. And productivity is the message we get in all in all parts of our lives, that our worth comes with how are we being productive, which is why I go to what I was saying earlier about learning to play again. Because I'm, you know, I think so many women do that particularly. I have to make this minute count, this half hour. Learning to go and say, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to do this and see what happens. Whether it's going for that walk and just going, eh, just let's see what happens. And if it's a waste of time, it's a waste of time. Um, I'd give two tips on... Um, starting the day. One is um, get a, if possible, get a dog or an animal of any description. <laughs> Dogs are the best 
for being present. I, don't know, I have a Labrador. <laughs> And you walk behind that, that Labrador and you just watch them and are like, here's a stick and it's great, it's the best stick ever. And there's this smell and it's fantastic. <laughs> you know, and you just... <laughs> Some people do this with small children as well because small children are like that. And it's just... That is being present, isn't it? It's just a great day, fantastic. I'm, at, I'm alive and there's food. Um, <laughs> Secondly, because we've been talking about what we do in our personal time, at work, we've all got different jobs, right? But I think that if we can start bringing into our work the value of considered responses. What I mean by that, I have a chapter on work about when we get to a point where you must, everything has to be answered immediately. And yet, unless you're like, I don't know, a, a brain surgeon, heart surgeon, if you're in close personal protection and trying to prevent, some, prevent somebody being assassinated, if you are landing planes, maybe, but in most cases, most of our jobs don't need the immediate response. So, you know, maybe slowly get into the habit of saying to your boss or your colleagues, you know, that's a really important question. I'd like some time to just, I'd like some time to think about it and give you a really considered response. So, Basically conveying, I get it, it's important, you feel it's really important. I'm acknowledging that by saying I would like to give it some time mm. and give you a quality response. Mm. Actually, that's one other thing that I'll mention uh, in your book, Christine, where you say there's this one tip that says, I think it says reset between tasks. Yes. Because we do this great thing with our to-do list where you go, this, until this time I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to call my mum, and then I'm going to do this thing, and then I'm going for dinner at this place, and you rush from one thing to the next. But you talk about just taking that sliver of silence and resetting in between tasks. It does wonders. It's so simple, but it really does wonders, because even I notice I'm walking around like this. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> No wonder you, we, we all want to Botox or think we do. So, <laughs> exactly. Sad faces. Yeah. Free, get a dog, get Botox. Yeah. <laughs> End of talk, guys. <laughs> We're done. Yeah. Um, and I think that's uh, all that we have basically time for today. Um, so, we can those see are the, the main seconds. takeaways. Um, and, oh, and there was, you know what, one last thing that we'll end it on, which was I loved, which was the. In your book, you talk about transformation is a rite of passage yeah. and we should embrace those hardships and enjoy the growth that happens from these and s focused silence, silence being an action. Yes. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Get a dog. <laughs> Get a dog. <laughs> We're done. That went by so quick. I know, it's so wow. good.